the subject, here I am, a statement of belief, is if you like something that was deeply personal to me because it was, there was a time in my life when I had to decide to stand up and say, well, here I am, Lord, and I had to act on that belief. Uh, and if you like, it's not just a statement of belief. Here I am, as we will see when we look at some individuals, is, is a call to action. God is speaking to these people that we're going to look at from the Bible, and he is saying to them something, and they are willing to hear that and then do as he says. So not only is it a, a belief in him, it is a, a call to action as well. What is up behind me on the screens is a very simple version of looking at the word faith, and I, and I want to do this. If you open your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, and I'll explain what we're trying to do here. Because as we read through the passages, I don't want it to be confusing, but Bibles translate the same word uh, different ways. Sometimes it's faith, sometimes it's belief, sometimes it's believe, sometimes it's believing, sometimes it's faithfully, sometimes it's faithfulness. But actually, there are just a group of words in the Hebrew, which was predominantly what the Old Testament was written, in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was written, which is one word, or is a, a, one word that has a number of roots that come off it, that means exactly the same thing. And often, the, the translators translate the same word, so whether that's Ammon or Imu or Imuna, which is in the Hebrew, or the Pistis, Pistu or Pistos of the Greek, the same way. And sometimes in some passages, they translate it both ways as belief or believing and faith. Uh, and Romans chapter 3 is one of those occasions. So, verse 23, for all have sinned, all for, uh, sorry, all for short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith by his blood. And that's the word pistos. And that's where it's going to come up twice more now as we read. So there it is, Christos, by faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might himself be just and justify of them which believeth, or believe in your Bible. Christos, same word. So there it is, it's translated faith, and then it's translated belief. And then it will go on to just help us out a little bit more. It will say, where is boasting then, verse 27, is it excluded by the manner of the law? Or works, nay, but by the law of faith. And there is the word pistos again, translated back this time as faith. So I want to put that across because as we look through the Bible and different passages tonight about these different men, sometimes it will say belief, sometimes it will say faith. The two are the same thing. Now the Bible is a wonderful book that is full of ordinary men and women, just like you and I, who God asked to do extraordinary things. They're ordinary in the sense that they come from every background that is possible. You know, there are statesmen, there are shepherds, there are tent makers, there are fishermen, to name a few. They are educated and uneducated. They're powerful, they're insignificant. They come from every social class that there is and every economic class that there is. God is not discriminate in that way. He, he takes from a broad spectrum of the population. But he asked them to do pretty ordinary, uh, sorry, pretty extraordinary things. Some of these people who were from, uh, from insignificant, unpowerful backgrounds were asked to become leaders of the nation and to go into battle before the armies of God and to fight huge battles where the odds against them were, were significant. Some who had no knowledge of architecture or engineering, no formal training, were asked by God to make the most monumental and wonderful buildings. They were asked to give up wealth if they had it. Sometimes asked to give up their position and sometimes asked to give up family. All of which are extraordinary things. And why did they do that? Simply because they believed in God. They trusted that what God would say to them would come to pass. And that willing, based on that trust and that belief of God, they were willing to put their conviction into action. And so they became extraordinary people by the nature of what they did. And we're going to look at four characters from Scripture. We're going to look at Abraham, Samuel, Isaiah and Ananias. And all of them would say, here I am, at the response of God. 
They would listen to what God had to say, and then they would put that into action in his service. So the first one is Abraham, and, and for those that were there this morning, we went there briefly. We're going to go there briefly again now. Abraham, Genesis chapter 22. And I do say no, this is not a character study of these four men. We could not do any justice to them in one evening, any individual one of them, let alone in the four or five minutes that we're going to spend on each one of them tonight. But I just want us to briefly understand the character of these people and what God is requiring them to do. Now, Abraham was asked and spoken to by God many a times and was asked to do uh, a number of extraordinary things. But here is perhaps for me personally the most extraordinary one that God required him to do, which would test his faith to the limit, yet he would believe and he would act. Um, we need to understand that previous to this chapter, in chapter 17, Abraham is an old man, over 100 or about 100 years old, and he has a, a son, but he doesn't have a son through his wife Sarah, who's of a similar age, whom he loves deeply. And so he's in conversation with God, he, he says to God that Ishmael would be the heir, and God says, no, no, it, there will be a seed that comes from you, and his name will be Isaac, he says, and he will be the son of promise. Through him, Abraham, all the blessings that I would bless you with will travel through him and will be made manifest to the rest of the population for all those who would believe in me for eternity. And that son of promise is born when we get to Genesis chapter 22. And he's a young man himself, a teenager perhaps. And what Abraham is asked to do is to take this son and to sacrifice him. And right away, there's an issue there. Because we know from Scripture in 2 Chronicles, and Abraham would have known this, uh, particularly in 2 Chronicles, the 23rd, the 28th, the 33rd chapter, that to sacrifice your children is an abomination before God. So we struggle when we read this passage, because why is Abraham being asked to do this when God says it's an abomination? Well, later we will see, when we get to the New Testament, something that Abraham understood about what was happening here. Um, we need to pick out here as well that in verse 3, Abraham is asked to go and take his son. So this is in verse 1 to start off. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. So there's our statement. So, hello God, here I am. And he says unto him, Take now thy son, thy only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mountains which I will tell thee of. Do you know, the unusual thing about that passage is that's the first time that the word love is used in scripture. And it is about this son. So God is using that word now, or the, or the commentators are using that word now through the spirit of God to tell us that this was a vitally important thing. The first time love is used. The son that thou lovest. This son of promise. Take him, Abraham, and offer him up for a sacrifice. I'm a parent. Two of my sons are here and they'll be pleased I make this statement. I would not sacrifice my two children. You know, not this way. I, I, I couldn't do that. I'd, I, I would struggle so much. But this ordinary man who has already done some extraordinary things doesn't delay. He doesn't think about it. He doesn't say, mm, I'll put that off for a little bit. I'll have a bit more of a conversation with God. I'll see if I can do this in a few days' time. Maybe he'll forget about it and I won't have to do it. Look at verse 3. Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. First thing in the morning, not even delaying to after breakfast. Up he gets, and off he goes. And he takes him, and, and, and you'll be very pleased to know, if it's not a story that you're familiar with, that he is right at the point of willing to offer his son, and God stops him. So verse 11, the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he says, here I am. The same statement. And the angel says, lay not thy hand upon the lad. And he doesn't. He doesn't have to sacrifice him. It's not our subject this evening, but we're going to talk about Jesus later. And this chapter speaks of Jesus <coughs> and his sacrifice wonderfully. And if anybody wants to discuss that, then we can talk about that afterwards but here is this man willing to act on his conviction to hear the voice of God and say okay 
I will do what you require me to do, even if what we're required to do is probably the toughest challenge that any parent could ever have. We're going to go to another son of promise now, a young lad called Samuel. He is a son of promise because his mother, Hannah, she asked God for this son and God gave him to her. And he was a son of promise, promised by God, but also promised by Hannah to go back to God, to worship or to work in the worship of God all of his life. That was the agreement that she made. And we find him when he's a young lad and he's back, if you like, in his apprenticeship under a priest called Eli at the temple uh, of the Lord. And um, we need to go, as it says there, to 1 Samuel chapter 3. And in 1 Samuel chapter 3, he's going to make this statement a number of times. But interestingly, although he hears the voice for the first couple of times, he doesn't, as a young man with not much experience of life as well, he doesn't understand who's speaking to him. So if we go verse 4, um, so the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, here am I. So there's that statement, here I am. But actually, if we were to read on and we went through 5, 6, 7 and 8, we would understand that he doesn't really know it's God that's speaking to him right away. He thinks it's perhaps Eli the priest. And he goes to Eli the priest the third time, that's in verse 8, and he, and he says, here I am, did you call me? And Eli then perceives in his wisdom that this is the Lord that called the child. And now let's watch the statement of this young man. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down and it shall be... if." If they call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear us. So he goes, and the Lord calls to him. And in verse 10, the Lord came and stood, and called as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And this time Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. So his first thing he says to God, in recognition it's God speaking to him, is, Thy servant heareth. Now, I don't know if you're anything like me, and if you pray, I quite often say the complete opposite. What I actually say in my prayers most often is, Lord, please listen. What Samuel is here doing is something for us, by very nature, we should learn from this young man's uh, understanding of God, is to listen to God first. Sometimes we think we can't do that in prayer. Well, we can. We can read his word. We can know what God requires of us. We can know his sayings. We can sometimes just meditate. The psalmist, David, writes that that is like listening, that that's meditation of our hearts. It's just listening to the things of God. And this young man listened first and is willing then to act. And God will say to this young man, who is of a tender age, look, I'm going to do something in Israel that's going to make every ear tingle. And it's a, it's a, a bit of a, a strange phrase, isn't it? Um, it means... it would. It would make you do this and be like, oh, no, I, I, did I really hear that? Did, is that something I want to hear? It's a phrase that does come up. It comes up in uh, 2 Kings chapter 21 and it comes up in Jeremiah 19. And we'll quickly talk about them in a minute. But it, it is in scripture associated with really big things being asked by God. Things that would turn the world upside down if you like. And here, this priest is of a line of Aaron and what God is telling this young Samuel who works below this priest and is his mentor and looks up to him is that actually this is the last priest of that line and that God is going to turn that priesthood upon its head and he's going to give it to another and that in Israel you have to understand would have been such a significant thing because that priesthood was supposed to be forever and God said no and coincidentally no because they're not listening God says they're not listening to my voice they're not hearing what I'm saying, and they're not doing them. They're not putting it into action. It says, you know, the voice is not going out of the temple. It's not being taught to the people under this man Eli and his children. And so this young man then, verse 15, after hearing that, he lays awake until morning, and then he opens up the door of the house of the Lord, the place where the Lord would dwell, the place where the, the, we know from Scripture the teaching of God was supposed to come out of, out of the door of that house into the nation. And if we had time tonight and followed Samuel's life through, we would find that Samuel is then all about teaching that word. Getting others to listen to the voice of God. He would set up the school of prophets so that people could teach. He would help establish the order for the temple worship so that the temple and the priests and all of that that surrounded would teach the nation of Israel about God. 
In uh, 2 Kings 21 and Jeremiah 19, it is used on both occasions as that tingling of the ear to take them into captivity. And again, if we were to look at the context of those chapters, and we can do that in our own time, or we can talk about it afterwards amongst ourselves, we would find that the reason that they are taken into captivity as a nation is because they do not listen to the voice of God. The next man that we're going to talk about is one of those prophets, and his name is Isaiah. And we need to go to Isaiah chapter 6. Now, interestingly, this is, if you like, the calling or the ministry of the prophet Isaiah in the 6th chapter. And most prophets, not all, but in most prophets, that happens in the first couple of verses of the first chapter of their book. Um, that's true of Jeremiah, it's, it's true of Ezekiel, it's true of most of those prophets, major and minor, that God will talk to them and they will know what they are supposed to do. But in Isaiah, it comes in chapter 6. If we had time, we would look at the first four chapters of Isaiah and we would see what the problem is. That this nation of Israel is not listening to God's word. So much so that a parable is told in chapter 5. And this parable is a well-known parable that the Lord Jesus Christ will use uh, later in his life. And he talks about a vineyard, Israel. And it, and it tells us it's Israel in, in this chapter. And it says that God had taken them as a nation and he had chosen them and he had put them in the land and he had planted them. He had hedged them about so that they were safe. He had, he had put a tower, his temple, in the middle of them so that they could learn and they could hear from him. And he said in that vineyard was supposed to bring forth good fruit. But it didn't bring forth good fruit. They weren't listening, he says. And that's the context that we get to Isaiah chapter 6, and we get the introduction to Isaiah and to, to who he is. And interestingly, we're going to contrast the holiness and the righteousness of God to the unholiness and unrighteousness of the nation of Israel. And Isaiah understands this because God is speaking to him. And look what Isaiah says in verse 5. Then said I, after he's heard about the beauty and the, and, and the righteousness of God, he says, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So the righteousness of God I've seen, and I now understand just how bad I am as, a, as an individual and not listening to him, and just how corrupt and bad as we are as a nation for not paying and giving the due sort of belief and action of our convictions to that God. And so he will tell him something. He says that he is going to do an evil uh, amongst the people. And look in verse 7. No, sorry, verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims uh, unto him, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from the altar. And he said unto my mouth, and said, Lo, that have touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And then... I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send to take this message? Is the context of this. Who will go out for us? Who will go into this nation of, of Israel who are, are so corrupt and tell them with, with, with words that are so strong, which is what Isaiah's ministry is full of, just how awful they have been and just how terrible the acts of God will be upon them if they do not repent. He doesn't think about it or turn around to look to see if there's anybody else in the room to do it for him. He says... Here I am, send me. And he has to go and take this message to them. Interestingly, this passage of scripture from verse 9 onwards is quoted by Jesus in both Matthew and John's gospel. And he talks about the inability of the nation of Israel at his time to listen to him. Um, so when we come to 7 the seventh chapter of Isaiah, verse 3, Then said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shea Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conjure, of the upper so he's got to go. And take heed, be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of smoke and firebrands, for the fierce anger of Rezin with us here, and of the son of Remamiah. And he, he's got to take this message out to the king and say to him, Do you know what God's going to say to you? God's going to tell you that everything that you hold dear is going to go. I'm going to take it away, I'm going to destroy it, I'm going to bring down this force from Samaria, and I'm going to destroy everything that you hold dear. And he says, send me, I'll take that message, here I am. He believed God enough 
that the conviction that he believed would turn into action. I think for balance, it's always good for us to now come out of the Old Testament and go to the New Testament. And we're going to go to the book of Acts and to the ninth chapter, to a man there called Ananias. And again, before we, we get to this man, we need to have a little bit of context very briefly about what's happening. See, before we're introduced to Ananias, the book of Acts is going to introduce us to a man called Saul. Saul of Tarsus. He is known at this time. Later, he will change his name and become the Apostle Paul. But Saul, at this time, is persecuting the church. So at the end of chapter 7, uh, in the last couple of verses of chapter 7, we read this. Uh, that Stephen, who is a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, is martyred. And calling up upon God, he says in verse 59, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. We need to continue our reading into chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And this is that Saul of Tarsus. He did not like these new Christians. He was a Jew. And he wanted to persecute them. Uh, if we go into the, the... He's responsible for the death of, uh, of Stephen, we can see this. And if we go into chapter 9... And verse 1, we can see just how much he hates these Christians. It says, And Paul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to go to Damascus, and that's important, to the synagogue, that if he found any of, of those that are of this way, of the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and do what he had done to Stephen. That's his hatred. And what actually happens in this chapter is as he's travelling with those letters of authority to Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is now raised from the dead, the resurrected Lord, and sits at the right hand of the Lord, will visit him in a manifestation of a bright light on the road to Damascus, which will make Saul blind. And he will have a conversation with Saul, and Saul will understand the folly of everything he's been trying to achieve. And he will then choose to serve God and the Lord Jesus Christ, which he does wonderfully well if we know him as a character. We need to go to verse 10. Because remember, he's on his way to Damascus to persecute the Christians that live at Damascus. And one of those Christians that lives at Damascus is a certain disciple, verse 10, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he says, Behold, I am here, Lord, or here I am. And again, this ordinary man is going to be asked to do an extraordinary thing. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul, a man of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he has seen a vision, and a man named Ananias, you Ananias, coming in and putting his hands on him, that he might receive his sight. And I, Ananias, says unto God, I have heard many things of this man, how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and how here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call upon thy name. And the angel of the Lord says unto him, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. He doesn't delay. He just goes. And he goes and sees this man, Saul. Now, I don't know about you, I don't know what trepidation I would go with. I don't know how fearful I might be at this moment. But look at verse 17. When he walks in, Ananias went his way and he departs and he walks into the building. And he puts his hands on him and he says, Brother Saul. This man that moments before the Lord had spoken to him, Ananias was in Damascus, knowing he was coming with letters to persecute, to drag them, to take them back to Jerusalem, and probably to stone and put to death. This man that hated the, Jew, the Christians with such a passion, and he's asked to go to him. And he can walk in and put his hands on him and use a term that we as a community use for our intimate relationship that we have in love with each other. Brother Saul, he says. Someone of like mind. Someone of the same precious faith. Someone who is walking towards God's kingdom with him. 
an ordinary man who is able to do extraordinary things. And then in verse 19, he baptizes him. And then he takes him to his own house. Sometimes the extraordinary things we're asked to do are simple. Hospitality, care for each other, thinking about the needs of others. But God asks them to do it. So why would these ordinary men do such extraordinary things? And it's simple. It's because they believed simply in God. They believed in what he said. They believed in what he would accomplish. They believed that he would go with them in the way. And when they heard his voice, they were fully persuaded to act in his service. This is what James would say of Abraham. But will thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? You can't just hear the voice he's saying. You have to do the act bit as well. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing that how faith wrought with his works, and by the works was faith made perfect, and the scriptures are then fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So you see, he says, how that by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Not just by belief, not just by hearing and believing, but taking that belief and having the conviction to do something with it. What God has asked you to do, he says. What well, God is speaking to you and I, to every one of us in this room, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our economic position or our social status, regardless of whatever trade we have or what we do or don't do for a living, regardless of our age as well. He is speaking to us. Are we sat here willing to say, here I am? Or are we willing, like we've saw this evening, to, to make those extraordinary journeys, to face extraordinary challenges, to make extraordinary decisions, to show an extraordinary character? Are we willing to believe to put our trust in God and in Jesus, like Samuel, like Isaiah, like Ananias, like Abraham. Come to John chapter 10. Because the Bible does speak to us. It speaks the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, the words of his heavenly Father in heaven. We read John, and um, the passage that I asked him to finish, finished where it did on purpose, and we'll, we'll go there for the next verse in a minute. But first of all, come to uh, John chapter 10 and verse 1. I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, and this is, this is the passage about the, the good shepherd, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, being describing himself as the good shepherd. He talks about his sheepfold. But climbing up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. It's him, he says. Then the porter open, and the sheep hear his voice. And he call his own sheep by name and he leads them out. So they hear, they believe and they are willing to be led out by him. If we come to verse 15 of the same chapter. And he says, as the father knoweth me, so I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice, he says. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. So there are others. After that time in John... There are going to be others, that's us today in this room, who are going to hear that voice. Other sheep to be called into that fold. And will we hear it? Will we believe? Will we act upon it? Verse 25. Jesus answered them. And this is because they have doubted who he is. They ask him to tell us, are you the Christ? Tell us plainly, the verse before says. And he says, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because you are not of my sheep, as I have said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand. And so he says, look, there are those that believe... Hear my voice and they will act upon it because they know that no matter what extraordinary thing I ask them to do in this life, if they do it, yeah, there are extraordinary blessings that come to them. Uh, the verse that uh, we didn't read 
uh, on purpose was verse 30, I and my Father are one. Not they are the one person, but they have the same purpose, he says. Everything I have done, my Father has done. My Father spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Samuel, and he spoke to Isaac, and he, uh, uh, sorry, Isaiah, and he said unto them, do these extraordinary things. And they said, here I am, here I am, your servant speak, sorry, your servant heareth, send me. They believed and they acted upon it. And the Lord says, this is what I ask of you as well. And we become extraordinary the minute that we believe. The minute that we take that conviction that we have and we transform ourselves from ordinary men and women into extraordinary men before God. Even as Abraham, Galatians 3 says, believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, which we saw James talk about. Know ye therefore that that which are of faith, that's us that believe, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So, they that which be of faith, those that believe, are blessed with the believing or the faithful, Abraham. We have extraordinary blessings. We have the extraordinary of hope that not only in this life does the Lord Jesus and the Lord God go with us, but that they have promised us something wonderful, and that is a life eternal with them, if we believe, are willing to say, here I am, and are willing to act upon that faith. Those are subjects for another evening to look at in more depth. But you know, the first thing that we are asked to do comes up at the very end of Mark's Gospel. The minute that we have belief, we are asked to do something. And again, it's not a subject for tonight, but it's a good place for us to leave. And the subject will come up if you're listening to this talk. It will come up again on other evenings. But in Mark 16, and on the 16th verse, the Lord Jesus Christ says this. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. He that believes, he that says, here I am, to the voice of God. The first act that God asks them to do, the first extraordinary thing that we are required to do, is to go into the waters of baptism. And through that, we enter into the blessings of Abraham and salvation. 